Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. We are observing a lot of anniversaries this month. January 6th was just last week, and next week marks Joe Biden's first full year in office. But there's one anniversary that isn't getting as much attention. 20 years ago tomorrow, the first prisoners arrived at the detention facility in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, in what would become an island outside the law where foreign detainees could be held for years without charge or basic constitutional protections and even tortured. Later on tonight's show, I'm going to take you through the 20-year history of Gitmo and speak to Mansour Adefi, who spent 14 years in detention there. Then I'll be joined by a panel including John Kiriakou, the former CIA agent who blew the whistle on the CIA's torture program, as well as Carol Rosenberg, the New York Times reporter who's been covering Gitmo since the day it opened. But first tonight, for months, we have told you that the orchestrated right-wing backlash against critical race theory was a Trojan horse designed to challenge the very idea of diversity in American society, an effort to mainstream hateful ideas and intolerance among our kids. We've now reached a point where a Republican lawmaker is saying that we should be neutral on Nazism. More on that in a moment. But here's the big picture first. According to a count by one academic, in the past year, there have been at least 67 bills introduced across the country to limit what teachers can teach in the classrooms. And they don't just ban critical race theory, a theoretical framework taught in law schools. No, these bills go after anything that advances diversity, equity, or inclusion, according to the human rights group PEN America, which calls these bills educational gag orders. And they are proliferating. And that's where you get to the teaching of Nazism in the classroom. Just look at the pending anti-CRT bill in Indiana. A high school history teacher told the bill's Republican sponsor in a hearing last week that he's afraid it could force teachers to teach that fascism was okay. Just wait until you hear what the GOP sponsor, State Senator Scott Baldwin, told him in response. Of course, we're neutral and like political issues of the day. We don't stand up and say who we voted for or anything like that. But we're not neutral on, on Nazism. We take a stand in the classroom against it. And it matters that we do. I'm not discrediting as a person uh, Marxism, Nazism, fascism. I'm not discrediting any of those isms out there. Uh, and I have no problem with uh, the education system providing instruction on the existence of those isms. I believe that we've gone too far when we take a position on those isms as it relates to we need to be impartial. Yeah, you heard that right. He said, we need to be impartial when it comes to the teaching of Nazism. Right. Baldwin did walk back those comments slightly after they sparked outrage. Quote, I was thinking more about the big picture and trying to say that we should not tell kids what to think about politics. Nazism, Marxism, and fascism are a stain on our world history and should be regarded as such. You don't say. This is not the first time Baldwin has had to do an authoritarianism-related walkback. In October, just before introducing his anti-CRT bill, a ProPublica investigation identified Baldwin as a one-time member of the Oath Keepers Militia, the far-right pro-Trump anti-government group whose leader had called for martial law to keep Donald Trump in office. So far, more than a dozen Oath Keepers have been arrested in connection with the January 6th Capitol insurrection. Baldwin initially denied any connection to the group until the Indianapolis Star showed him a $30 payment he made to the Oath Keepers in 2010. That's the exact cost of a membership at that time. Baldwin now says it was a donation to the group made while he was campaigning unsuccessfully for sheriff, but he declined to renounce the far-right group. Yeah. You have supporters of militias making education policy in this country, not just in the Indiana State Senate, but in small towns like Eatonville in Washington State, where voters just elected a gun-toting, CRT-hating member of the Three Percenters Militia to the school board. And get this, she's the second member of that militia to get onto the five-member board. America in 2022. By the way, would you believe this wasn't even the first time that educators have been told that anti-CRT legislation requires them to teach both sides of Nazism, as we learned from this piece of advice given by an administrator to a group of Texas teachers last year. And make sure that if, if 
if you have a book on the Holocaust, that you have one that has opposing, that has other... How do you oppose the Holocaust? Do we really, do we really want to live in an America where we're both sides in Nazism? And that too in our classrooms, with our kids. And so is the biggest threat to your children in school right now critical race theory or just good old fashioned racism? Joining me now is Ruth ben Giat, professor of history and Italian at New York University. She's also the author of Strong Men, From Mussolini to the Present, and publisher of Lucid, a newsletter on the threats to our democracy. Uh, Ruth, thanks so much for coming back on the show. The Indiana Bill's Republican sponsor walked back his comments on being neutral about the teaching of Nazism. But why does this keep coming up? When we talk about these critical race theory bills, it always ends up with something to do with fascism or authoritarianism? So there's a couple of things happening here. First is this, uh, and it's not just in Indiana, an attempt to uh, to ideologue, like to make it the school system full of ideologues by pushing out teachers. And in Indiana and in, in Florida, Ron DeSantis is talking about that, you know, teachers have to make curricula, uh, give parents control of curricula. And that allows parents to become like these vigilante enforcers. And here we have parents who could be linked to these far right groups. And so whenever you have creeping authoritarianism, you have attacks on educators, you have attacks on expertise. And so that's part of what's going on here. The other part is obviously you, you are trying to silence people. I write in Strongmen that strongmen disappear bodies, but they also disappear fields of knowledge and histories. So here there's a concerted attempt to uh, either, you know, have a both sidesism on the atrocities, especially right wing ones, because if you silence histories uh, of racial injustice or Nazism, and, and in some of this legislation, the, the proponents say, we don't want students to feel guilty or responsible. But if you take away the moral compass, if you take away the feeling of responsibility and guilt, it clears people to be able to per, you know, perpetuate injustices and become persecutors themselves. Yeah, there's always that persecution complex uh, when they're doing this stuff. Uh, there's this new reporting from Politico, Ruth. Legislators in at least a dozen Republican-controlled state houses, including in Alabama, Kentucky, North Carolina, and Ohio, plan to push dozens of bills in upcoming legislative sessions that aim to halt teachings about race and society and give parents more say in what's discussed in classrooms. Will critical race theory be a 2022 political barometer? There's a clear power incentive. Republicans are amped up by the parties. November election sweep in Virginia, where education was a top issue, and intend to campaign on such bills leading up to the midterms. Ruth, when conservatives talk about empowering parents, letting parents decide, they're talking about white parents. That is the natural assumption, even in much of our media coverage. I mean, I, as a brown parent, have no problem with my kid being taught about institutional racism or that the Nazis were bad. Yeah, and we can hone it further because... Um, this is a very well-funded attempt, and the other the other part of this equation is uh, this is a big agenda of evangelical Christians, who are a huge GOP and Trump, uh, you know, constituency. And Mike Pompeo tweeted in October that parents should be control in control of the curricula. So, so what at the big picture, this is an attack, a concerted attack on secular and liberal and democratic models of education. And I also see this as parallel to what's going on with election workers and election officials. If you're not going to support the propaganda, the big lie, you're being pushed out. And here they're targeting teachers and they're targeting entire curricula. And so this is part of this kind of propaganda operation, but it brings, you know, evangelicals are in it too. So it's white Christian hegemony that schools are going to become tools of keeping white Christian hegemony alive in America. Ruth, uh, Steve Bannon, the former Trump strategist now uh, running this far-right podcast, uh, he's been telling supporters to focus on local elections, and in particular yes. on school board races. And now we see members of the three percenters getting elected in Washington state. Where do you see this going across the course of this year? <laughs> Yeah, this is this is a strategy of capturing the state from the from the, the you know smallest offices that are very significant in communities up to uh, eventually the White House. 
and it's a kind of uh, insurgency. And you have you politicize everything. You make everything divisive. You sent again vigilante enforcers, and this is happening all over America, uh, pushing out other kinds of people who don't want to be threatened. And so it's a kind of uh, capture uh, mentality, capture the terrain, because Steve Bannon views this as a battle, a battle for control of America. And it's not just the White House, not just the Senate or the House. It's it's locally local power as well. And this is a long-term strategy, which has also been funded by people like the Kochs, and Democrats have not had anything to counter it. And so it's very important that people start to run for school boards and start to run for these local offices if they weren't before. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll be kind of swept out of the playing field. And one last question, Ruth, just on the, just going back to Indiana, because I can't get it out of my, can't get it out of my <laughs> head. Neutral on Nazism. In Texas, you have uh, administrators saying both sides of any Nazi texts. I mean, this is where this stuff leads, right? And you know and I know this is not just right wingers. We've had liberals, centrists, some Democrats also complaining about wokeness gone mad and social justice warriors on campus um, and critical race theory. And some of us have tried to say, this is where it ends up, where, you know, you get to a point where the right gets what they want. You made the point they're trying to drive teachers out, but also where we can't even say basic stuff like, you know what, the Nazis were bad guys. Yeah, then this is part of a concerted effort, and it's a global effort, actually, that, that comes all yes. the way to, you know, Indiana, to uh, depict authoritarianism as good. Hitler had the Autobahn. It's efficient. It's all these myths about dictators. And that's one reason I wrote Strongman, is to debunk those myths and show that it's highly destructive, that it leads to mass disease and mass tragedy for peoples. And so we cannot be neutral on the Holocaust, on Nazism, on fascism. And this is, this is a, an attack to silence us and take away our memory and replace it with some kind of memory and fake history that suits the right today. Ruth, I think I first interviewed you, if memory serves me correctly, about authoritarianism back in 2016. I, I think when we spoke then, neither of us would, thought, would have thought in 2022, six years in the future, we would be discussing Republican lawmakers saying, well, let's be neutral on Nazism. But that's where we are today. We appreciate your analysis, your insights. Uh, you've been ahead of the curve on a lot of this stuff. Thank you for your time tonight. As we've just been discussing, the Republican strategy heading into these midterm elections is to borrow that old liberal line about thinking globally but acting locally and not just when it comes to school board races, but also when it comes to the administration of elections at a state and local level. Just look at the so-called precinct strategy pushed by Steve Bannon, who is encouraging the pro-Trump far right to take over local posts that supervise the placement and operation of voting locations. While many Democrats are complaining about a national holdup on voting rights legislation, Republicans are working to take over elections from the bottom up. It's a point Ezra Klein makes in his latest column for The New York Times. Quote, in order to protect democracy, Democrats have to win more elections. And to do that, they need to make sure the country's local electoral machinery isn't corrupted by the Trumpist right. But a key way to stop the Trumpist right, ironically, is through federal legislation that gives you one consistent nationwide benchmark for voting and voting rights and voting standards. But so far, nothing can get through the Senate because of the GOP's use of the filibuster. Tomorrow, President Joe Biden is going to Georgia to give a big speech on the importance of voting rights reform. But several civil rights groups, including Black Voters Matter, say they are boycotting the speech because it's time for action not more words. They're not wrong. But with two Democratic senators refusing to rid us of the anti-democratic filibuster, hello Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, is federal voting rights reform dead in the water? Joining me now is Democratic Congressman James Clyburn of South Carolina, lifelong civil rights activist and the House Majority Whip since 2019. Congressman, welcome back to the show. Joe Biden is giving this big speech in Atlanta tomorrow night on voting rights and democracy. He's given a fair few big speeches on voting rights and democracy, but we haven't seen any action as a result of it. He didn't sign a single voting rights bill into law in 2021. Is that going to change, do you think, in 2022? Well, thank you very much for having me. 
You know, I think that um, what we have to keep in mind uh, is that the issue of voting uh, in this evenly divided Senate and closely uh, margin, uh, close margin majority uh, in the House requires that we spend a little more time uh, trying to get to where we need to be. And I think uh, that when you see 50 Republicans uh, and two Democrats not wanting to do anything with the filibuster, we have to do a little more work, getting them to understand that what they are doing is seeking to deny some fundamental constitutional rights to a significant portion of the American people. Yes. To take for granted, the 50th Amendment said- of the United States Constitution is the amendment that gave the former slaves the right to vote. It was a straight party line vote. It was not yes. bipartisan. And so yes. you're telling me that if a bill that have any legitimacy it has to be bipartisan, that's the history doesn't teach us that. And so I think that so, we have to be very care, careful here and carry these arguments uh, in a very careful way. And on the filibuster, you, we're not asking for the Senate to take up the House passed bill. We're asking the Senate, we've already agreed to uh, Joe Manchin's bill, uh, the Freedom to Vote Act. Uh, Stacey Abrams down in Georgia came out and endorsed it right away. I've been publicly in support of it. And that's the bill we're asking to be considered. So Joe Manchin yeah. seems to be supporting the filibuster of his own bill. So that to me, been- yes. Joe Manchin, as you say, is one of the two Democratic Party big blocks on passing this bill, on passing his own bill, on saving American democracy. You pointed out, as you said a moment ago, that when you look at, for example, uh, the 15th Amendment, it was not a bipartisan vote. It was a straight party vote. Black people benefited from that vote hugely, got rights from that vote. You say history teaches us that. So let me ask you this. Why then does Joe Manchin keep insisting on bipartisanship? Does he not understand the history or is he indifferent to the rights of black Americans? Which is it? Well, I don't know which is, because I can't get into his head. So all I can tell him... But you must have spoken to him. Yes, I've I've talked to him. He tells me that he supports what we're doing. He's demonstrated that he supports it by putting up the Freedom to Vote Act. That's his bill. So if he did not support the Freedom to Vote, why did he put the bill up? So I think that what he's trying to do is have it uh, both ways, and you can't. It seems to me that he's got to decide whether or not he wants his own bill. And if he wants it, then we here to say to him, give us the two votes that will allow us to change the rules so that we can bring the bill to the floor. And then you can go back home and tell the bill you got your, your bill passed. Last quick question, Congressman, before I let you go. How much time do you think American democracy has left? If Democrats lose the House in November, do you think a Republican-led House come 2024 will even agree to certify a win for a Democrat in the presidential election? And where does that lead to? You know, I've been telling people for some time now, and I believe very strongly, uh, that the filibuster is on its last leg. Now, either we get rid of that filibuster business now, or we will lose the House, and they will get rid of it, the Republicans get rid of it in the next Congress. Because if we do not pass these bills, I don't see how we can have unfettered elections in November where every vote will be counted, where the nullification efforts down in Georgia and other places. This is not about suppressing the vote. This is about nullifying the votes that have been cast. That's what's in this law that just passed down in Georgia. This is about criminalizing, giving people convenience, people standing in line for four and five hours. And if you give them a bottle of water, that is considered a criminal offense. That's what's going on here. This is a throwback uh, to centuries that we thought were behind us. 
Congressman, thank you for speaking clearly on this issue. I do hope Joe Manchin is listening to you on this. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Still ahead, when I say Oz, what do you think of? A yellow brick road, a wizard, a girl with shiny red shoes? Or do you think of a place that's trying to keep an anti-vaxxer tennis star out as a judge just ruled to let him in? We're going to talk about that later. The land down under and the particular tennis player on the other side of this break. Don't go away. I'll give you my thoughts. You don't need to be a huge tennis fan, and I confess that I'm not a huge one, to be following what's happening in Australia these days. Today, or maybe tomorrow with the time difference, it's always hard to tell, fans of the top-ranked tennis player in the world, Novak Djokovic, were celebrating in the streets of Melbourne after a judge ruled that Djokovic could stay down under in order to play in the Australian Open. The judge said he was somewhat agitated by the case and asked what more Djokovic could have done to prove his medical exemption to enter the country. Oh, oh, I know this one. I have the answer to what more Djokovic could have done to get his visa approved and entry into Australia. He could have gotten vaccinated, just like everyone else who wants to enter Australia during a pandemic is required to do. As we begin, by the way, year three of the pandemic. I feel like, you know, that should be always a personal decision, whether you want to get vaccinated or not. Um, so I'm, I'm supportive of that. Uh, so whether someone wants to get a vaccine or not, that's completely up to them. And I hope that it stays that way. That was the tennis champ at the U.S. Open last August. And it makes you wonder, who is Novak Djokovic re really? I mean, really, besides being a dangerous anti-vaxxer, of course. Although maybe we should talk more about that a bit. First, his medical exemption plea to Australia was based on the fact that he'd already had COVID twice. His first infection came at a series of exhibition games he ex hosted uh, in the summer of 2020 when he and his wife and a number of other pros on the tour tested positive. They were criticized for the lack of social distancing at the events and for the late night partying, and he even apologized for it at the time. His second infection, though, came just last month. On December the 14th, Djokovic had front row seats at a basketball game in Belgrade. A number of folks who attended that game tested positive afterwards, so maybe he caught it there. Djokovic's court documents do say he took a PCR test two days later, December the 16th, and the results came back positive seven hours later. He appeared in public that same day at a ceremony in his honor when he already suspected he might have COVID, unmasked, as you can see. And what about the next day, the 17th, when he definitely knew he was infected and he handed out trophies, maskless again, to youngsters? Or the day after that, the 18th, when he posed again, maskless, at a photo shoot for a French newspaper? Serbian COVID regulations require a full 14-day quarantine. Djokovic didn't even go 14 hours. But I guess if you're Novak Djokovic, there's one set of rules for you and one set of rules for everyone else. Just ask his brother. Is it true that on the 16th of December he did test positive and he knew he was positive? He positive. Okay, yeah. Yes, uh, the whole process was uh, public and all the documents that are public are legal, so... Was he at the event on the 17th of December? Oh, oh, okay. Please the coffee. Okay, so uh, this press conference is adjourned at the moment. Hey, I said ask his brother. I didn't say the brother was going to answer the question. And maybe Novak believed wolf energy was going to protect everyone around him. It's one of the many crackpot cures the tennis star has turned to throughout the years. He also believes it's possible to alter the composition of water and food through the power of positive thinking. And he's made pilgrimages, plural, to so-called Bosnian energy pyramids, hailed by many for their healing powers, except experts say they're really just a bunch of ordinary garden variety hills, nothing ancient about them. But his crackpot conspiracy theories aren't actually the worst thing about him. You'll recall that in the late 1990s, the government of Slobodan Milosevic engaged in a campaign of ethnic slaughter in the name of Serbian nationalism. Well, years later, Djokovic, whose own, father, whose own father calls him a proud Serbian nationalist, said, we are prepared to defend what is rightfully ours. Kosovo is Serbia. He said that in 2008. Does he regret those comments? On the contrary, he was recently spotted sitting next to the leader of a notorious Serbian paramilitary unit at a wedding. 
His family said he didn't know the guy. And his father was just this week claiming that the conservative government of Australia was keeping Djokovic captive because they wanted to stomp all over the Serbian people. It's nationalist nonsense, of course. You know, the Australian government chucks asylum seekers in offshore open-air prison camps to languish for years on end. Djokovic got five days in a Melbourne hotel room. So let's calm down. And look, there are a lot of people all around the globe, not just the Djokovic family, who don't yet seem to understand, and maybe they never will, that if you're going to choose not to inoculate yourself against the coronavirus, and that it's an enormous privilege to have that choice, that decision is going to come with consequences. If he wanted, uh, he will be playing here in Australia without a, a problem, no? Everybody... Uh, is uh, free to take uh, their own decisions, but then uh, there are some some consequences. No, in some way, I I feel uh, sorry for him, but at the same time, um, he know he knew the conditions since uh, a lot of months ago. So, Rafa is a bigger man than me. I can't feel sorry for an ethno-nationalist, anti-vaxxer, conspiracy theorist no matter how good at tennis he is. Enough about Djokovic, he's no victim of injustice. But you know who were? Hundreds of men detained at Guantanamo Bay for years without charges, often cases of mistaken identities. Tomorrow marks 20 years since Gitmo was opened. After the break, we'll speak to a former detainee who spent 14 years there after being kidnapped by Afghan warlords. We'll also talk to the CIA agent who exposed torture at the camp and the only journalist who covered the story from the very beginning. But first, we'll take a look back at the dark 20-year history of Guantanamo Bay and what it all means. That's in 60 seconds. Do not go away. U.S. forces at the naval base in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, are busy today getting ready to deal with al-Qaeda and Taliban prisoners. The first of up to 2,000 are expected to arrive by the end of the week. We have uh, 20 detainees inbound. These represent the worst elements of the al-Qaeda and the Taliban. We ask for the bad guys first. The treatment of the detainees in Guantanamo Bay is proper, it's humane, it's appropriate, and it is fully consistent with international conventions. 20 years ago, on January the 11th, 2002, just four months after the attacks on 9-11, U.S. military guards received the first detainees of the so-called War on Terror at Camp X-Ray in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Twenty men chained in unforgettable orange jumpsuits that would soon become a horrifying global symbol of America's human rights abuses. Four presidents, billions of dollars, countless lies and false promises, and yet Gitmo, what many thought would be a temporary facility, still remains open today. A place the ACLU calls the longest standing war prison in American history, and what Amnesty International once named the Gulag of our times. Their existence will be that they'll be provided uh, a, a humane but not comfortable uh, place to live. It was a reassurance that wouldn't last long. Human rights groups began sounding the alarm the moment they saw the use of chain link cages to confine the detainees and read reports of the original 20 men having been drugged, hooded and shackled on the 20 hour flight, even being chained to their seats and barred from using the bathroom. How do you respond to charges from some non-governmental organizations that hooding, shaving, chaining, perhaps what even... other words? Hooding. Hooding. Word putting second. hoods on the... Sh shaving, chaining, perhaps even tranquilizing some of these people are violating their civil rights. Um, that, uh, that that's not correct. Um, <laughs> that you've done it or that you've done it or that, it, that it's a violation of their rights. It, it simply isn't. As I understand it, uh, technically, unlawful combatants do not have any rights under the Geneva Convention. Guantanamo from the very beginning was conceived by Bush, Cheney and Rumsfeld as basically an island outside the law, where they claimed the Geneva Conventions and the US Constitution did not apply. A patch of foreign soil, where foreign detainees could be endlessly detained without charge, interrogated without constitutional protections, and yes, tortured. 
The American public, told that these prisoners were the worst of the worst, didn't seem to care. A Gallup poll taken three weeks after the first prisoners arrived in Cuba showed that the vast majority of Americans believed the US treatment of those detainees was acceptable. But the rest of the democratic world didn't agree. In 2004, the International Committee of the Red Cross inspected parts of the prison and concluded that it could not be considered anything other than an intentional system of cruel, unusual, and degrading treatment and a form of torture. But the Bush administration kept denying it. The values of this country are such that torture is not a part of our soul. This administration rejects torture. There's a reason why we signed these treaties to protect my son in the military. That's why we have these treaties. So when Americans are captured, they are not tortured. One of the most disturbing cases was of a 15-year-old Canadian boy named Omar Qadr. Sent by his father to be a child soldier for Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, Qadr was captured by U.S. forces accused of launching a grenade that killed a U.S. soldier and was sent to Guantanamo Bay. A 2006 Rolling Stone investigation described his detention in shocking detail. Guards chained the young boy to the floor of an interrogation room. They pulled his arms and legs behind in a bow position until his limbs strained painfully at their sockets. Eventually, he urinated himself. The guards mocked him, poured pine oil solvent all over his body. Without altering his chains, they began dragging him by his feet through the mixture of urine and pine oil. The idea was to use him as a human mop. He was not allowed a change of clothes for two days. You know, I'm not a doctor, but I think you're getting the medical care. No, I'm not. You're not here. We left a child, a Canadian child, in Guantanamo Bay to suffer torture. And not only did we leave a child to suffer torture, we, Canada, participated in this torture. Khadr would spend a decade in custody. He pled guilty in 2010 to killing the American soldier, but later said he only did so to end the torture he suffered. In 2017, the Canadian government apologized and gave him $10 million. Khadr is now a free man. The despair of indefinite detention and uncertainty was too much for some. 30-year-old Adnan Farhan Abdul Latif spent a decade at Gitmo without being charged. Despite being approved for release in 2009, he never was. He died by suicide in 2012. U.S. officials acknowledge dozens of suicide attempts since detainees in the war on terror were first housed there after 9-11. Over the past two decades, nine detainees have died in custody. Seven from what the military has said were suicides. The Pentagon disputed allegations that it was because of abuse. These at times inhumane policy choices have had serious global consequences. There's also no question that Guantanamo set back the moral authority that is America's strongest currency in the world. Instead of building a durable framework for the struggle against Al-Qaeda that drew upon our deeply held values and traditions, our government was defending positions that undermined the rule of law. Instead of serving as a tool to counter terrorism, Guantanamo became a symbol that helped Al-Qaeda recruit terrorists to its cause. Obama was right, and groups like ISIS have sent pretty clear, pretty brutal messages through their treatment of hostages. It is no coincidence that the recent ISIS videos showing the barbaric burning of a Jordanian pilot and the savage execution of a Japanese hostage each showed the victims clothed in an orange jumpsuit, believed by many to be the symbol of the Guantanamo detention facility. The greatest single action the United States can take to fight terrorism is to close Guantanamo. On more than one occasion, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled against the Bush administration on Gitmo. Bush says indefinite detention. We, we say Geneva Convention. But the prison camp stayed open. Barack Obama signed an executive order to shut down Guantanamo Bay in his very first week in office. But he was blocked by Congress, and the prison camp stayed open. Donald Trump, well, he campaigned on a promise to keep it open. And we're going to load it up with some bad dudes, believe me, we're going to load it up. And announced an executive order in his first State of the Union address to do just that. At its peak, nearly 800 men were detained at Gitmo. Yet only 12 of them have ever been charged, including notorious men like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and four others accused of orchestrating the 9-11 attacks. 
But those 12 were charged in military commissions so flawed and questionable, often using confessions given under torture, that the majority of rulings have repeatedly either been thrown out by the courts or are so mired in legal complications that detainees may never see a trial or a conviction. A legal and ethical disaster of America's own making. Successive administrations have admitted they knew they were holding innocent people in custody, including men like 24-year-old Mustafa Al-Aziz Al-Shamiri, who officials admitted in 2015 was arrested in a case of mistaken identity. He spent over a decade of his life enduring abuses for activities that were carried out by other known extremists with similar names. Today, 20 years after it was first opened, Guantanamo Bay still holds 39 detainees. 14 of them are neither being recommended for release nor are being charged with anything. They're known as the forever prisoners. 13 others who've been detained for 15 to 20 years have been cleared for release by a panel of America's most senior defense and intelligence agencies, and yet they're still being held in detention including 73-year-old Saifullah Abdullah Paracha, who President Biden cleared to leave Gitmo last year. Captured in 2003, he is the oldest and the sickest prisoner, suffering with heart disease, diabetes, and high blood pressure. Like Obama, Biden has said he wants to close it. In December, though, he signed into law Congress's annual multi-billion dollar defense bill, which the president himself admitted actually makes it harder for him to shut down Gitmo. And the Pentagon's already building a new, more secret courtroom at the base to open in 2023. The war in Iraq is over. The war in Afghanistan is now over, too. These days, we're busy fighting a global pandemic, not international terrorism. And yet, Guantanamo Bay still remains open. 20 years later, a permanent stain on our conscience, an affront to our democratic and constitutional values, and perhaps the most stark and occasionally visible reminder of the failure and the horror of our war on terror. During the 14 years Mansour Adefi spent detained at Guantanamo Bay, he was known simply as Detainee 441. At age 18, he says he was kidnapped by Afghan warlords and turned over to the CIA in exchange for a cash bounty. Despite being a Yemeni native, Adafi says he was accused of being an Egyptian al-Qaeda leader and forced to endure unspeakable torture. He was force-fed through unlubricated tubes in his nose. He had his bones broken. He watched his friends die and spent days in solitary confinement before finally being released in 2016. He details his experiences in Guantanamo and his ongoing effort to close the infamous detention center in his book, Don't Forget Us Here, Lost and Found at Guantanamo. I spoke to Mansour Adefi, who now lives in Serbia, earlier today. Mansour, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Uh, your book is called Don't Forget Us Here. But sadly, the reality is most of the world and most Americans have forgotten about Guantanamo Bay and the people still held there. On this 20th anniversary, what is your message to Americans watching at home tonight? You know, thank you so much, uh, Mahdi, for having me to the show. Our message is really simple. That message we have been fighting for the last 20 years. So we are fighting for ju justice, you know, justice for Guantanamo, and not just for Guantanamo. We are fighting justice for American uh, justice system that have been abused and misused. That was created Guantanamo in the first place. In the first place, misuse and abuse of uh, power. I intentionally wrote that book for American readers and audience to bring them to inside Guantanamo to tell them the truth about. Guantanamo. You mentioned the truth about Guantanamo. You were sent to Guantanamo Bay when you were a teenager. You were there for 14 years. I cannot imagine what life is like in any prison for 14 years, let alone in Guantanamo. How did you get through that? How bad was it? And how did you survive? You know, Mahdi, Guantanamo was created out of the... Uh, uh, justice system was created out of the humanity zone. It was a black uh, site within a military base in Guantanamo. It was intentionally uh, selected and created that the, the Bush administration made sure that there is no law about Guantanamo, American law, Korean law, or uh, Geneva law. 
so they could do whatever they want and it was a message that they could they, the, the american government they can go as far as they want in any case at guantanamo you know around 800 men uh, or 50 nationalities over 20 languages spoken that place was actually the, when they started constructing what they call enhanced interrogation technique, I love those things, or what they call, uh, we call it enhanced inter, uh, torture technique. Guantanamo was turned to be experimenting uh, in, in humans and, and, and prisoners at Guantanamo. So, so when you talk about surviving at Guantanamo, I don't know if we really survive at Guantanamo because we have a lot of mental, physical, and psychological uh, problems. You know, uh, we have scars that maybe will never heal. So, Spending those time at Guantanamo, we will ask me, how do you spend your 20s? How do you live your 20s? I don't know what 20s means. If you ask me 20s, I don't know. I just live in a place. I always exist in a place inside like a box for 14 years. Those period 20s, I don't know. I never experienced them. I never experienced them. I didn't know what, how they look like. I didn't know what this means, what this means to be in your 20s. Well. And you were eventually freed in 2016, uh, sent to live in Serbia, uh, even though you're from Yemen. Did you get an apology from the United States government? Do you want an apology from the United States government? That's why you wrote the book in the first place, first to bring the truth and reality about uh, Guantanamo, because Guantanamo, as you know, is like surrounded by secrecy. And as you, as you, uh, uh, as you know, in the report that CIA destroyed all the evidence of torture and abuse uh, as Guantanamo. So I was sold to the CIA for bounty money as a Qaeda general, nine of insider. They call me uh, Egyptian 55th Brigade. This is how I was sold. By 2015, they told me it is unclear if he actually joined Al Qaeda, and none of Al Qaeda uh, leaders or Al Qaeda members recognize him as a member of Al Qaeda. I was released to Serbia against my own will. I was sold to the CIA, brought to Guantanamo as a, a kidnap, and Serbian government and most of the hosting uh, uh, countries received millions of dollars to take those uh, released prisoners. So basically, it is just chaotic. It's upside down world. You have no say. It's been like 14 years in Guantanamo. Didn't know why I was there until when or what's going to happen or to where I'm going to be released. Yes, I was sent to Serbia, uh, the place I don't want to go to. I had no idea about this country, as, as you know, like the Serbian history with Muslims. So. Of course, there, is, there was no apology, there was no any compensation, there was no any kind of acknowledgement to what happened to us, and we still live in Guantanamo 2.0, live in the stigma of Guantanamo. And of course, we are looking for, for justice, you know, we are seeking justice. We spent 15 years fighting yeah. for justice, but we are seeking justice. Of course, we need for uh, looking for apology. Well, justice means apology, mean accountability, mean uh, acknowledgement, mean compensation. Because you see, life after Guantanamo, many of us still facing many difficulties yeah. and challenges. Some of the brothers lost their lives. Some of the brothers, you know, uh, you live in limbo. Some of the brothers, you know, uh, there actually... Are, yeah. There are 39 detainees still held there, 14 of them considered to be forever prisoners. Uh, you were released in 2016, uh, and I'm glad about that, but you're right, there needs to be accountability. Mansoura Davy, thank you so much for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Still to come in our continuing coverage of the 20-year anniversary of Guantanamo Bay, I'll speak to the former CIA agent who blew the whistle on the CIA torture program. Stay with us. In the 20 years since America brought its first war on terror detainees to Guantanamo Bay, our political and media classes have never really owned up to just how egregious that island prison camp is, how offensive it has been to our values and to our constitution, and how shamefully it's still part of our future. The New York Times reported just two weeks ago that the Pentagon is currently building a second courtroom for war crimes trials at Gitmo that would exclude the public from the chamber. As Carol Rosenberg, a longtime Gitmo a reporter put it, the latest move towards secrecy. So is there really a way to close Guantanamo Bay anytime soon? Can President Joe Biden do what President Barack Obama failed to do? And will there ever be any real accountability when it comes to one of the most inhumane and arguably unlawful creations of our war on terror? 
Joining me to discuss all of this and more is the New York Times' award-winning senior reporter, Carol Rosenberg. Uh, she's the only journalist who's been covering all aspects of the U.S. detention facility full-time since even before the first detainees arrived 20 years ago. Also joining us, John Kiriakou, the CIA case officer, turned whistleblower. He was sentenced to prison in 2013, in part for being the first government official to confirm the U.S.'s use of torture against al-Qaeda-linked detainees. He's also the author of The Convenient Terrorist, Abu Zubaydah and the Weird Wonderland of America's Secret Wars, which tells the story of one of Gitmo's so-called forever prisoners. And Bahar Azmi, he's the legal director of the Center for Constitutional Rights, which filed the first cases challenging Guantanamo detentions nearly 20 years ago and still represents five of the, rem of the remaining 39 men being kept there. Bahar has described his work as lawyering in a lawless space. Thank you all for joining me tonight. Uh, Carol, let me start with you. You've been covering this beat for longer than anyone. You said you've counted being there, I think, 1,500 nights before you stopped counting. Did you imagine we'd have detainees from the war on terror 20 years after we first brought them over to Cuba in 2002? Absolutely not. This seemed like a, a enterprise that would be ending with, I mean, President Bush said he wanted to close it. And for a period of time, I actually believed President Obama when he said he would close it. But, in a, it, but pretty soon we realized that uh, for President Obama, closing Guantanamo meant moving Guantanamo to the United States and holding some of the detainees there. And Congress blocked it. And so we've been stuck yes. with this situation now for 20 years. We have. And uh, a situation that's involved some horrific crimes. John, you revealed back in 2007 the use of torture, waterboarding in particular, against a man you helped capture, Abu Zubaydah, uh, who was accused of being an aide to Osama bin Laden. Have a listen to what President Bush said in 2006 about the use of torture against Abu Zubaydah. We knew that Zubaydah had more information that could save innocent lives. But he stopped talking. And so the CIA used an alternative set of procedures. These procedures were designed to be safe, to comply with our laws, our Constitution, and our treaty obligations. I cannot describe the specific methods used. I think you understand why. John, how strange is it that you, the man who helped capture Abu Zubaydah, is now saying he should be released from Guantanamo? He should be released. You know, I, I, I like to think that I'm not the only person who believes in the rule of law and who believes in the Constitution in this country. If the 39 men who are being held at Guantanamo are as bad as our government says they are, then they should have uh, the opportunity to face their accusers in a court of law and to be judged by a jury of their peers. And if they're not going to be uh, sent to uh, some federal court somewhere to face charges, they should be released. Either we're going to be that country that uh, that supports and defends human rights, or we're not. We can't have it both ways. No, we can't, although, and we just played that Bush clip, uh, none of the Bush people, none of the CIA people were involved in authorizing or doing the torture uh, went to prison. But you went to prison right. for exposing the torture. Absolute madness. <laughs> Here we are all these years later, and I still uh, shake my head when I think about it. The last time I was on your, your show, Mehdi, I said that life takes a very odd uh, twists and turns, and, and it, it really does. But I keep telling myself that we're supposed to be the good guys, and the good guys are supposed to lead by example. And that's what we have to do, lead by example. You know, when we first started capturing uh, these prisoners, the Pakistanis uh, told me that we were filling their jail and we had to do something with them. So I asked headquarters, what do you want me to do with these prisoners? They said, send them to Guantanamo. Guantanamo, Cuba? Why would we do that? They said, because we'll hold them there for two or three weeks and then send them to either Washington, New York, or Boston, where we're going to try them in federal court. That was a good idea. Keeping them forever is a decidedly bad idea. Indeed. And, Bahar, we've heard all kinds of horrifying stories of torture and abuse, things like threatening to rape the men's wives and daughters, uh, sexual abuse of the detainees, beatings that left them heavily injured, uh, keeping them in freezing cells, uh, guards allegedly peeing on them. What was the hardest case you had to work on at Gitmo, the, most, the case that made you most uncomfortable as an attorney and as a human being? 
thank you, Matthew. I, I um, that in a way is like the inverse of picking my favorite child. Um, <laughs> all of the cases in Guantanamo reflected government uh, cruelty, incompetence, brutality, and attempted to mask the humanity of individuals like Mansoor, who you had um, on earlier. Uh, I would draw attention to one of our clients, Majid Khan, who was tortured brutally in CIA detention and who was finally put um, uh, into a sentencing, sentencing hearing by a jury of military peers. And they were so outraged by his treatment that they specifically wrote the judge to request clemency, like basically a, va a vacate, vacator of his sentence, because one, he'd been held without any semblance of due process. Two, um, he was young and lost at the time he um, committed the alleged crimes. And three, he was subject to forms of torture that you would associate with the most uh, brutal regimes in the modern era. And as we, just for context, as we mark the one-year anniversary of the authoritarian attack on the rule of law at the Capitol, it's worth considering Guantanamo's own authoritarian bona fides as a prison intentionally constructed outside the law, justified by DOJ lawyers with premium education, endless yes. brutal interrogation and torture, um, and uh, uh, legitimize this remarkable concept of a definite detention or without charge or trial going on 20 years. It's the values of the gulag, not of a, a country that's genuinely committed to constitutional democracy. Yes, the values of the gulag. And Carol, you reported last month that the Pentagon is building a new courtroom that will be kept out of public view, set to open in mid-2023. Uh, a couple of questions. One, how does that fit with this administration's desire, professed desire to close it down? And two, where is everyone else on this? You seem to be the only person consistently reporting on this view. The rest of the U.S. media just moved on. That's correct. Um, it stopped being front page news a long time ago and people just moved on. Um, the, the new courtroom is a bit perplexing. It was authorized and, and started as a, as a concept under the Trump administration. And as best as I can tell, nobody in the Biden administration has taken a look at what they're doing and kind of balanced out the plans to get on with the Guantanamo enterprise and try to close it with the idea that there'll be a new courtroom in 2023, which will have no yeah. public access, meaning if people want to see what's happening in that courtroom, they, they are taken to another location and shown a feed that's on a 40-second delay at the discretion of the judge and the intelligence Awful. service. Um, so this is, a, this is a perplexing issue, and I really haven't gotten any solid questions about it. In terms of... Yeah, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how you can... I don't know how you can you can set up a courtroom uh, in the future, a new courtroom, and then say you're also shutting it down. It just makes no sense to me. We're, we're out of time, but I've, I just want to... Last word to you, John. 30 seconds to go. Biden says he wants to shut it down. Obama said he wanted to shut it down. Do you have more faith in Biden than you had in Obama? Uh, no, I don't. And I'm so sorry to have to say that, but I don't think we can trust any of our leaders, whether Democrats or Republicans, to keep our word to the international community that we're going to respect uh, uh, international law. The only thing to do, the only right thing to do is to shut it down. We should have never opened it in the first place. Biden still has, of course, time to, to do the right thing, but I, I don't think that he has the, uh, the political juice. Well. People like us, I guess, have to keep calling it out and calling him out. John Kiriako, Carol Rosenberg, Bahar Azmi, I wish we had more time for this discussion. Thank you so much for your time tonight. I appreciate it. That does it for me tonight. Make sure to join us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook. And I'll see you back here tomorrow night live at 7 p.m. Eastern right here on The Choice from MSNBC. Good night. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.